Welcome back to another video on my channel. The new Nikon C9, which was just announced, is a beast of a camera. Maybe this is the best camera going into 2022. We'll get our unit of that new camera in December into our studio and then we'll take a couple of weeks to intensely test it and then also come back on this channel with my comprehensive review. Besides following Nikon closely and listening to what they have to say about their new flagship camera, of course I also went through the web and screened all the different blogs and opinions and there is one aspect which I want to address in this video, namely that the Nikon C9 gets along only with an electronic shutter and has no mechanical shutter any longer. And that caused a lot of speculation but also confusion in the web because people started to speculate what's the readout time of the sensor, will there be a rolling shutter effect and will it be a disadvantage if a flagship camera has no longer a mechanical shutter. In this video I will take a few minutes to explain how an electronic shutter really is working and how we can conclude from the specs of the Nikon C9 what the true readout time of the sensor is. Hopefully this video will contribute getting away the confusion in the web and now let's kick off the video. The new Nikon C9 shoots 120 frames per second and is actually only equipped with an electronic shutter. So let's have a look how this is playing out and how Nikon is presenting this to us. And by the way, the new processing engine is an X-Speed 7 processor and is tested for speed. So let's have a look and then let's get into the discussion and the main topic of this video. So in that last clip we saw that Nikon is saying, and that's a correct statement of course, if you don't have a mechanical shutter, but you work with electronic shutter only, you are minimizing distortion. You also have no issues with durability any longer because a mechanical shutter is of course vulnerable to being used many times over time, and typically a mechanical shutter lasts for between 100,000 and 200,000 shots. But the problem with electronic shutter is that if the readout time of the sensor is too slow, like here on my Hasselblad X1D Mark II, where I took a time lapse with the electronic shutter, you see distortion in the diagonal direction, which is called a rolling shutter effect. And you see this clearly here on the tram when it's passing by where the rolling shutter effect fully is kicking in. So I might have missed it, but I don't see actually that Nikon is telling us explicitly what the readout time of the sensor is when it comes to electronic shutter. And I think it's hidden in the specs. I'm going to explain this now and uh, as a second question and we will do some back of the envelope calculations. How can we be sure that the readout time is fast enough to avoid that rolling shutter effect we saw before on the time lapse? In order to understand how to determine the readout time of the sensor from the specs which are provided to us by Nikon, we have to do first a little excursion into how a mechanical shutter works. Then we move on to electronic shutter and then we'll basically get away all the confusion which I see currently happening in the web. In order to see how a mechanical versus an electronic shutter works, let's go into the Nikon C7 Mark II menu and let's go into the shooting display menu here. And then we have here shutter type and under shutter type we have auto. That means the camera in a mechanical setup decides whether you use the electronic front curtain or not. And what I wanna do is I wanna go for mechanical shutter first and do a slow motion basically to illustrate how the two curtains are working together. I removed the lens and I went for a shutter speed of 1 over 50 seconds and all the rest of the parameters are actually not really playing a role here. The slow motion I recorded with one of my smartphones and I went to a 256 times slowdown. That means I could only record in 720p so apologies for the bad quality of the video in a 4K video of course but I will be able to make my points. When you switch on the camera, the sensor is activated because otherwise you would not see a live view in the electronic viewfinder and on the LCD of the camera. When I push the shutter button, the first thing that happens is that the front curtain closes and the camera is now ready to actually record the scene in front of the camera. The front curtain then opens and exposes the sensor to light and for the time of 1 over 50 seconds, which was my exposure time, the sensor will be exposed to light and then the rear curtain closes and ends the exposure taking. 
Let's now go into this menu again and let's go for electronic front curtain shutter and let's see how the difference plays out. Again with a shutter speed of 1 over 50 seconds. If I release the shut now, the front curtain will no longer play a role and the sensor will start to record the scene in front of the camera and then when the exposure time 1 over 50 seconds is over, the rear curtain closes and ends exposure taking. Now in the specs of cameras, you typically find one parameter which is very important and that's called the flash sync speed. And here for the Nikon C7 Mark II is 1 over 200 seconds. Now in order to understand why this information helps us to exactly determine the readout time of the sensor in an electronic shutter setup, I go back to my slow motions again and show you how this plays out if we repeat the experiment with 1 over 200 seconds and then go beyond the maximum flash sync speed. So I adjusted the shutter speed now to 1 over 200 seconds and we repeat that slow motion and watch how the front curtain and the rear curtain are actually playing together. I did reset the shutter setting to fully mechanical so we don't have electronic front curtain and now the same will happen as what we saw in the first slow motion clip the front curtain closes and the camera is ready to take exposure, then the front curtain opens, exposes the sensor to light and immediately when the front curtain arrives at the bottom, the rear curtain starts to close too. Let's look at this again and please note that here there is no delay as soon as the front curtain hits the bottom, the rear curtain starts to close and that's a very important observation here. Looking at this, we clearly get the point. It seems that 1 over 200 seconds, which is in the specs, the flash sync speed of the Nikon C7 Mark II, is the fastest shutter speed where still the full sensor is exposed to light. So let's have a look at what happens if we go beyond the flash sync speed and do this at a significantly faster shutter speed. And in order to make it crystal clear and super tangible, let's go to a much faster shutter speed here, 1 over 640 seconds and watch how the front curtain and the rear curtain are now getting very close together. Based on a shutter speed significantly faster than the flash sync speed, the rear curtain will now not wait until the front curtain reach the bottom, but it will follow closely and in this way have only always a smaller section of the sensor exposed to light when exposure taken. This is how it looks like when I stop the slow motion in between and you see here this small section of the sensor and that generates what people know as light banding when they try to do flash photography beyond the flash sync speed. We'll see in a moment that there are strong parallels between mechanical shutter and electronic shutter when it comes to so-called CMOS sensor, which are the sensors which are in most digital cameras today. And let's bear this in mind for a moment. If we go beyond the flash sync speed, then there will be light banding and there will be no time where the full sensor is exposed to light to actually record what's going on in front of the camera. Now, the sensor in the new Nikon C9 is a so-called stacked CMOS sensor with the same resolution as what we had on the Nikon C7 Mark II, for instance. And I don't want to comment here on what stacked means, but I want to stick to the fact that this is a CMOS sensor. And there are so-called global shutter CMOS sensors which you rarely find in modern digital cameras today, but most of the CMOS sensors in digital cameras today, they actually process light recording pixel line by pixel line. So we distinguish CMOS sensors as sensors with a global shutter, and uh, that means that every pixel on the sensor is simultaneously exposed to light and recording light, and between rolling shutter CMOS sensors, where the light recording actually happens pixel line by pixel line and that's exactly what we have in the Nikon C9. And the terminology rolling shutter also gave the name to that rolling shutter effect which I demonstrated by means of that time lapse with the Hasselblad X1D Mark II in an earlier part of this video. So when we look into how a rolling shutter works on a CMOS sensor, so an electronic shutter with a rolling shutter and not a global shutter, that's where a lot of confusion kicks in which you find currently in the web when people talk about the Nikon C9 but also in general and I want to clarify how this correctly works. So what you see here in front of you is an illustration of a CMOS sensor, you see a pixel matrix and when people say that the sensor records light line by line then we have the first pixel line exposed recording light, the second, the third and so on until we reach the bottom of the sensor and then exposure basically has been taken. So here's some of the confusion which happens in some of the articles because people say 
The first line records light and takes exposure with the shutter speed prescribed in the camera. And uh, then the second line records light with that shutter speed, then the third and the fourth, the fifth and so on. And that cannot be for the following reason. Let's make a quick calculation example why this must be complete nonsense and can never work. Let's assume we have a camera with a CMOS sensor and an electronic shutter which can go in longest exposure time up to one second. The Leica SL2 is a good example for such a camera with such a CMOS sensor and you can find in the specs that electronic shutter works actually up to one second. If we then look into the resolution of such a camera, so for the Leica SL2, you see it here on display, then we talk about 5584 pixel rows and if each of these pixel lines would be exposed by one second and this would happen sequentially, then we would end up at an insane time to finally get the exposure taken with electronic shutter for a one second exposure. And I should say maybe I didn't look this up diligently enough, but I found only one reference in the web at this website, which you see here on display in front of you, where this was actually well explained and in the way it should be explained. So let's zoom this in here a little bit. Let's get this in the center of what we are doing. And then here we see it. So instead of exposing all pixels at the same time, the sensor starts exposing line by line, but now it comes starting from the top down to the bottom in the way I illustrated before. But similar at the end of exposure, the first pixel line is stopped first, then the second and so on all the way to the bottom. This happens in parallel to the readout. As soon as a line stops exposing, it is read out. Because of this integration line by line, this shutter mode works a little bit like a curtain or a rolling blind. This is why it is called a rolling shutter. But the most important hint in that article here is, and that solves the contradiction or the seeming contradiction between my example with the Leica SL2 and this insane amount of time you have to wait before exposure is taken and the statement that a CMOS sensor basically records light line by line. And that's here when it says at the end of exposure, the first pixel line is stopped first, then the second and so on. And what that means is that a CMOS sensor, yes, records light pixel row by pixel row, but in an overlapping way. And overlap means that in contrast to many illustrations you find in the web, which I find personally misleading, the CMOS sensor, yes, records pixel row by pixel row, but not in a way like you see it here and in the way I showed it at the beginning, but more in a way like here, where you actually start again at the top and have the first pixel row exposed, but then there is overlap between very likely several pixel rows and then here basically exposure taking ends. If you look at that illustrative animation, what does it remind you in? Clearly in the curtains from the top to the bottom, we saw before when we looked into a mechanical shutter. It works in exactly the same way, just electronically. And in the same way as we saw on mechanical shutter, where if you go beyond the flash swing speed, we actually only have a small section of the sensor exposed to light and get light bending, if we use a flash with a shutter speed faster than the flash sync speed, in the same way the flash sync speed of the Nikon C9 is 100% correlated to the readout time of the sensor. And the flash sync speed of the Nikon C9 in the spec sheet is revealed to us as 1 over 200 seconds up to 1 over 250 seconds. So we have a range here, but then basically the specs continue with 1 over 200 seconds here in the spec sheet. And by the way, the difference between 1 over 200 or 1 over 250 seconds, if you could actually set it up in the camera, does not make a big difference because the banding effect will not be visible in practical situations. So does that mean that the readout time of a CMOS sensor with a rolling shutter when it comes to the electronic shutter is always fully correlated with the flash swing speed for all cameras? Well, the answer to that is no. And I'll point out in a few seconds why this is the case, because otherwise we could claim that the readout time of the sensor in the Nikon C7 Mark II and the new Nikon C9 are the same because they have the same flash swing speed. But that's actually not the case because Nikon in their advertisement for the Nikon C9 clearly says that the readout time and the data processing is up to 12 times faster on the Nikon C9 than it is on the already very good Nikon C7 Mark II. Given everything I said and explained in this video, for cameras with a mechanical shutter, 
The flash sync speed in general does not provide to you information about the readout time of the sensor. Whereas if you have a camera like the Nikon C9, then based on everything I said, the flash sync speed, which is the fastest shutter speed where the whole sensor without light bending still gets exposed, is 100% correlated with the readout time of the sensor. And that means in our case for the Nikon C9, we have a readout time of the sensor between 1 over 250 and 1 over 200 seconds, which equates to 5 milliseconds or 4 milliseconds and gives us a range here, which by the way fully coincides with the readout time of the sensor of the still new Sony Alpha 1. It turns out that if you follow the discussion and speculation and the first insights into the Nikon C9 in the web, you actually also find 4 milliseconds as the most frequently mentioned readout time for the new sensor of the new Nikon C9. But you also find a lot of questions where people actually ask and try to understand why it should be 4 milliseconds. And if you look into the spec sheet, we find actually 1 divided by 200 seconds as the more reliable number mentioned by Nikon, which would then come up with 5 milliseconds as the readout time for the sensor. And as mentioned before, it's exactly the same as what we see on the new Sony Alpha 1. So the readout time of the Nikon C9 and the Sony Alpha 1 will be about the same, but in contrast to the Nikon C9, the Sony Alpha 1 still has mechanical shutter and you can choose in the menu what you want to use for your shooting. This also puts the advertisement by Nikon a bit in perspective. So yes, this is a super fast readout time. Yes, they have an X-Speed 7 processor now, which will also be super fast. And yes, it's actually a smart idea to have no mechanical parts any longer for durability reasons, but also to avoid shakes and vibrations when you take a shot. But it's not the first time that we see a camera as fast as the Nikon C9. The Sony Alpha 1 seems to be in the same order of magnitude and still offers the optionality of a mechanical shutter. So we have two comparable cameras here and the good news and clearly conclusion is, as you can read in the web by people who already did shoot a lot with the Sony Alpha 1, but I can also confirm because we have a Sony Alpha 1 in our studio here, the Sony Alpha 1 has hardly any issue with rolling shutter and you actually wouldn't need a mechanical shutter in a camera with such a speed and such a readout time like you have it on the Sony Alpha 1. So Nikon is just consistent and consequent, thinks this through the end and basically avoids to have any mechanical parts at all when it comes to the shutter mechanism. And that's a good thing. I fully appreciate it. I embrace the idea. And since we don't have any issues with electronic shutter on the Sony Alpha 1, we won't have any issues on the Nikon C9. And I'm very much looking forward to get this camera here in the studio to fully test it. Nikon provided many sample clips and sample images with the promotion of the camera. And in general, I think the images look quite well. The tracking and the high speed burst mode seem to work very well and the images look really good. Also, there are a few images where I personally think in the micro perspective, they are a little bit fuzzy. Nowhere in the images or video clips, I saw any rolling shutter effect occurring. So that looks also very good. But clearly we can also do a back of the envelope calculation to convince ourselves that the readout time of the sensor is quick enough to, in almost all of the cases, avoid rolling shutter effects. Based on everything I said in this video, let's conservatively assume that the readout time of the sensor is 5 milliseconds and not the 4 milliseconds which we find all over in the web. Let's now further assume that we want to take photos with the new Nikon C9 at a sports event with human beings. And let's remind ourselves that the peak speed which we've likely seen some years back on Olympia was in an order of magnitude of give or take 40 kilometers per hour. Very likely on our sports event will have much slower speed. Dividing 40 by 60, we end up at 667 meter per minute as the speed we are looking at here. Dividing 667 by 60 again yields 11.12 meter per second as the speed which we have to deal with. Dividing the 11.12 by 200, because 1 over 200 second is our readout time of the sensor, we end up at 5.56 centimeter in the period how long it takes for the sensor to read out the data in full. Assuming that Nikon has also incorporated computational photography in the new Nikon C9 and then also taking into account that your distance to subject is also playing certain role here, I don't think that there is difficulty in freezing subjects if they move fast and quickly 
And again, given that the Sony Alpha 1 has no issues with electronic sensor when it comes to rolling shutter, and given the sample images we saw from Nikon, I think we are on the safe side, having only electronic shutter in the new Nikon C9. I hope this video was able to explain and illustrate some of the questions which came up in the context of an electronic shutter only camera. There are not many cameras on the market who rely on electronic shutter only, but I'm 100% confident that the Nikon C9 will do very well with that new concept and by the way will be a fantastic camera. Very much looking forward to review this camera around Christmas. If you liked that video, don't forget to drop me a thumbs up. Thanks for watching, stay tuned on my channel, there is always more to come, stay safe and healthy and of course, peace out.